Well, hello and welcome to the Hope Report, a ministry of the Lindell Recovery Network. I am Melissa Hooray, so glad to have you with me. I have a great show planned today. We're going to have a guest coming on in about 10 minutes or less. It's Dennis Cole, and I'm just so excited for you to meet him in just a little bit. But before we get to that, I'm already having a very busy day. Uh, This morning, I had an interview on a great podcast called Seeds of Hope with Penny and Dell. Uh, Penny Cook is another author friend of mine, and I'm excited to bring that to you once it's produced. But it was such a great Holy Spirit-filled interview, and I just love that when the Spirit is moving among the three of us. I didn't have to perform. I didn't have to get nervous. It was just such a blessing. So check out Seeds of Hope with Dell and Penny. It was just a perfect fit for the Hope Report. I keep trying to move my mic, not in front of my picture there. Okay. And then I have another interview after this with a gentleman with a podcast called Sober. I think it's called Sober Wise Guys. So it's been a great day and anytime, I I basically never say no. When someone invites me on their show or wants me to share my story or talk about my book, I'm always very, very grateful to do that when God opens a door that way. But before I get too ahead of myself, let's pray. I absolutely wanna pray for Dennis and his message today. And also if you would join me in prayer, um, we're going to meet with our pastor tonight at five o'clock and talk about some tough things going on in our family and um, just, you know, asking for the community and the Hope Report family to come alongside me and my family as we go and meet with our pastor. So let's all bring our cares and concerns and our praise reports before the Lord now. Father God, I just come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I surrender this time to you. I surrender this moment and this show. May it be for your glory. And Jesus, I thank you, first of all, I thank you for my friend Dennis and the work he is doing to bring the Bible alive, to share his life story and his gifting that you have given him, to share it with people, his eagerness to do that, and just getting to know him and what an amazing man of God he is. And Lord, I just pray that you would anoint him to bring a powerful message today, that you would draw the people together who need to hear his words, and just that people would be touched and enlightened and lifted up by Dennis's time with us today. Lord, we ask for protection for him and we thank you for him and his wife, Wendy, and their ministry and everything you are doing through them. We just pray you would abundantly bless it and that you would bless his book, The Man, and his his Narrowgate News and his theater ministry, Lord. Uh, We just ask you to bring the people who will be touched by this testimony today. Lord, we pray for everyone with a need on their heart today. Uh, We just come alongside them. We rejoice with those who are rejoicing and we come together with just with empathy and compassion for those who are struggling. Lord, may we be willing to share our time and our talents and our gifting and our money and everything we have, just like the early church did, that we would be selfless, that we would open up our hands, that we would not try to keep things to ourselves, but we would take what you have blessed us with and freely share it with other people. And show us, Lord, who you want us to bless today. And maybe it's by a word of encouragement, maybe it's by giving them a phone call or sharing a meal with them or just telling them you appreciate them. I pray that each one of us would find a way to do that today. And Lord, I pray for the meeting tonight with Pastor James. I thank you for him and I thank you for his his work with for the kingdom, everything he has done in his years of ministry, he and his wife Heather and their daughters and their dedication to serve you. Lord, we thank you for Bethel's Rock Church and all that they are doing for the kingdom. And Lord, we thank you for James's heart and his willingness to meet with us. We ask that you would be present in that meeting, that the Holy Spirit would speak through James to us and that we would receive the message, and that we would act on it. We commit this show to you, Lord. Take it and do what you will with it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, again, so glad to have you with me. It was a long prayer, but I have a couple housekeeping items, and then we will get to our friend Dennis Cole, who I just had the pleasure of spending a little bit of time with at the most recent NRB convention. And Dennis was on the show nine months ago, but I was not, I was either on vacation or gone that day. I can't remember what I had going on, but I wasn't able to be part of that show that Jason did. 
So I'm so glad that today I will get to really hear Dennis's story for the first time, just like you all will be doing as well. Before that, let me share a couple testimonies. First of all, from a faithful supporter of the Hope Report. Her name is Lisa. She's been following this ministry since day one. I'm so grateful for her. She's also on Getter and she interacts a lot with this program. And I mean, just one of the people that is on there every day without fail, unless she has, you know, something going on, but for the most part. And she posted a comment yesterday on the Lindell Recovery Network face page, Facebook page. If you haven't already, please go and follow and like it. The Lindell Recovery Network, I'm always, posting things there and would love to have you connected to that. But Lisa said, this is her uh, posting yesterday, years running away from myself and trying to fill a hole that only God could fill. I struggled with nicotine, alcohol, and eating disorders, endless years of therapy. I want to thank you and Ray Froning. Finally, a miraculous breakthrough. I have been delivered by God's grace and mercy. God bless. What an amazing testimony. Uh, Rafe is a friend of the Hope Report, a friend of mine, a friend of Mike Lindell. He was actually Mike Lindell's counselor back in the early days of, of Mike's um, addiction. And Rafe spoke some very pointed words to him. And Rafe always says, he, I'm no respecter of persons. You know, I don't get swept away by people's fame or influence or platforms. And when you meet him and get to know him, you see that that is absolutely true. He really is. He is himself. He doesn't get, you know, um, swooned or swooning by, by people's money or fame or prestige or anything. And Mike was in his addiction treatment group and Mike was telling all these stories. Mike said this many times, so I'm not calling him out or anything, but Mike was saying, yeah, telling all these stories of things he did in his addiction and, and Rafe just cut it all off. And he said, Mike, let's talk about your relationship with your father. And Mike always talks about that as like a pivotal moment in his recovery. When somebody just kind of saw through all of his, his comedy routine and the deflecting he was doing and got to the heart of the matter. And Mike has since talked a lot about his father wound and the wound that he had from having a broken home and how that impacted his life and led him into addiction. So Rafe is a friend of the Hope Report. He has a church here in the Twin Cities called Truth and Freedom Church. And I've personally been very blessed by the church in many ways and Jolene Feist and the other people in ministry there. But uh, Lisa was very impacted by Rafe's teaching and by this show. And I just couldn't be more grateful for testimonies like that. It really shows me that I am in the right place and doing, doing the Lord's work that he's called me to do. One more thing before we bring Dennis in. Brian Tucker, my good friend from Christian Mix 106, he runs the Hope Report on his channel, on, on his network, and he has built an amazing ministry. He was called into it. He was obedient. He followed the Lord and where the Lord was leading, and he has built this incredible resource for people with Bible teaching and music and just helping fill and edify people with the Word of God. So Brian left this Amazon review five stars for blackout to blessing and you can get it at melissahooray.com but he said an incredible read and powerful testimony melissa has borne her soul literally by taking the reader through an incredible transformation that took place in her life she has described in all detail what she went through going from such a deep and dark place to the shining light she is today i have gotten to know melissa over the past year or so and now reading this gives me an ever-growing appreciation for who she is and what she does. I have a friend who uses the term horror story to glory story. And that sums up what this book is. Thank you so much, Brian, for that review. And the friend he's talking about is my friend too, Michelle Davenport. And she always says that about her testimony. It's a horror story to glory story. So thank you for the review. And Brian, I just appreciate you and the work that you do. My book is Blackout to Blessing, How the Perfect Love of Jesus Saved Me from the Highway to Hell. But enough about that. I want to get to our guests now. And there's the QR code for my book if you want to scan it and get a copy for yourself. Uh, I keep doing interviews, testimonies, and talking about it everywhere I can. I want to help people throw them a lifeline and help pull them out of the pit uh, just by sharing what Jesus has done in my life. Well, let's shift gears here to our guest today. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about Dennis Cole. And before I do that, I wonder if we could run that video. I have a short video, it's about one minute long. 
about Dennis's ministry. One as aspect of his ministry, he has dramatic Christian ministries, and then he has Narrowgate News. So I wanted to share this brief promotional clip from Narrowgate News, if we could run that. This is the Narrowgate News Show with host Dennis Cole. Narrowgate News recognizes that history happens once, but Bible truth is being expressed by God, the Holy Spirit, through his reporters right now. This same Holy Spirit has inspired Narrowgate News to report and interpret what is truly happening in our world today. Host Dennis Cole has a college degree in literature and acting. He's also a seminary graduate, a professional actor, author, and ordained minister. We now present to you Dennis Cole and the Narrowgate News Show. Thank you for participating participating with us. Thank you for participating in our Narrowgate News Show. We hope you have experienced with our host, Dennis Cole, great insight into current events. Our vision is that Narrowgate News inspires a hunger to know what's happening in our world today, that this broadcast challenges your faith to grow closer to God, and it encourages you to share more love and truth with others. We look forward to sharing more with you on our next broadcast of Narrowgate News with host Dennis Cole. So that's just a little clip about Dennis and Narrowgate News. And Dennis is such a humble person. You would never know that he has all of this acting talent and degrees and seminary degree and everything that he has done in his life because he is just such a submitted and humble servant of God. But Dramatic Christian Ministries and Narrowgate Theater bring the Bible in the first person to people in order to fully minister the word of God. The focus of the drama ministry is to equip and uplift the church and show the way to eternal life to the unsaved. So let's get Dennis Cole in here and hear more about what he's doing for the kingdom. Hey, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Oh, Dennis, I'm so happy to that. see you. Uh, you know, it's funny. I can't see you. Is that the way Oh, you is? can't. I, 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 see I don't know. I see me. I've heard. I, I, is it okay I if you can't me. see me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. And uh, okay. you know, that's fine. I, We'll roll but, with uh, it. I don't know. Yeah, I'll go with it. It's fine. I I, I know I'm a, I'm there. I just got to say <laughs> that um, I I know there's a lot of viewers here uh, that love Melissa, but she's the most uh, uh, unpretentious, transparent media person I've ever known. I've ever met. I've met a lot too, and uh, it's just an honor. It's just it's just oh, great thank to, you. Uh, watch you grow as a person and. Uh, uh, it's just been great. Just, just glad well, to Dennis, be in your company. Thank you. I'm blessed by that very much so. And I keep thinking of seeing you at the most recent NRB when you yeah. so patiently waited. And then you came up to me and you said, Melissa, Thank I have you. to ask you, were you going through a struggle last summer? I just, I get, yeah. I get this sense that something was going on with you. And then you started speaking yeah. some very specific things. And I was very, very shocked by that. Very shocked by your intuition and the Holy Spirit speaking to you about that situation. I could just tell how genuine you were in that moment. You know, um, it's, it's true. I, I remember that very well. I, I, for the most part, I don't, I don't try to do anything. I try to be anything. I just try to be in the moment. And uh, there's a great word that I learned. And I've been an actor for many, many years. I was an actor before I was a Christian. That's for sure. But uh, I just want to segue to this one point. The word inside skin is a word that describes uh, empathy on steroids. It's like uh, he who knew no sin became sin. That's tremendous compassion. That's the compassion that Jesus has. And the Greek word, uh, I, I don't know how to say it, but it describes inside skin. And I actually teach people acting based on uh, identifying with whatever the other person is going through, whoever she or he is, but just relate to it. Uh, do it uh, on stage when you're when you're in character with another character, uh, and do it in life when you go home to your spouse, uh, to some stranger you don't know. Uh, it's it's where uh, theater meets ministry because it's the same thing. He who hears these words of mine and acts upon them. That's his final words in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' final words. Builds his mm -hmm. house on the rock. It's it's total. It's pr it's practicing uh, care, uh, but hearing and identifying. You can never identify completely with another person, but you can definitely feel what they feel, and you can put yourself into it. Um, 
I always yeah, say, you know, don't don't play yeah. Jesus. Let Jesus play you. Yeah. I know exactly yeah. what you mean, Dennis. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but when you're saying that, no, I relate. No, I relate so much to what you're saying because I, I feel like that's the only way I know how to interact with people. And maybe it's the kind of brain I have or the empathy or the highly sensitive person nature. But whenever I've got a guest on, it's like comparing and joining and making, you know, finding similarities and finding those things right. that I can draw out. And, you know, and I think that I instantly right. started to do that with you. And that's why I felt that connection with you. Well, another another thing that reminds me of something so significant, uh, the word learned with regard to God is, a, 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 to my knowledge, used only once. And it says Jesus learned obedience. And that's that's amazing itself. It's how God learns. What do you mean? God knows everything. What do you mean learns? Well, God's teaching us what knowing everything is. <laughs> we don't know what everything is. He's telling us what it is. Well, God, who knows everything, can learn. And I believe he learns through experiential encounters mm. with with you and me at any time with any person. But he learned through suffering and he doesn't stay suffering, goes through the suffering. And it's so valid that that we could value suffering and go through it. And uh, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know, have that going on. Uh, there's a drill I'm going to do with uh, actors a couple of uh, tomorrow night, as a matter of fact, in an acting workshop. It's the Ecclesiastes drill. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to dance. Mm -hmm. Time to break down. A time to build up. And I find that in real life, they're happening simultaneously. And suffering, though, to use a, use a term again, is how we learn. But we suffer through, and it becomes glorious. It's just, mm. it's just wonderful. It's just a, I uh, love that. Uh, I, yeah, it, you know, the process is fun. It's enjoyable. It's painful. I said this to audiences. I've done about 2000 events the last 20 years. I say, you know, healing is painful. Yes, and it if is. you understand that, there'd be more healing. <laughs> Yeah, it is painful and pain can move us into repentance or move us oh. to where God wants yeah. us to be for sure. But right. I want to talk about your journey a little bit, Dennis, because I don't know a lot about it. But what was your childhood like and what led you into ministry and theater and everything you're doing now? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, it, it, people think of me as an extrovert and, and I probably am, but... <laughs> To talk about myself in terms of uh, testimony and stuff like that, I had to prepare a little bit because I, there's certain things I don't like to talk about or, or I don't want to talk about. Some things I never talk about. But certainly, this is very personal. Um, I thought about it. I, what, what makes me me and why am I? Uh, sometimes I call, I call myself and I identify with others this way. I call it the minority of one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a minority group, I'm me. Yeah. <laughs> and I find people can identify with that. You versus um, you. <laughs> when I was, yeah, right. Well, you know, if we if we got in touch with our uniqueness that God's given us, let's say there's mm. 7.5 billion people in the world, uh, there'd be 7.5 billion unique people. And there'd be nothing but unity and, and uh, cooperation and support for one another. We wouldn't be individualistic and, and, and antagonistic. We would be in harmony. It's funny. Uniqueness actually creates commonality. But mm. we, we find conformity to, to, to culture to be, to be the thing. And if you're in the drug culture, if you're in the, the wrong culture, you know, obviously. Yeah. Well, Dennis, we're going to take a short a break. On? We're going to take a short break. Sure. You can think about how you want to answer that testimony question, whatever you want to touch on. I'll go right to it. And then we'll come promise. right back on the Hope Report. Stay with us. I'm excited to announce we're having a huge My Pillow Spring Sale. And here's a few examples. Buy one of our My Pillow 2.0s, yet get another My Pillow 2.0 absolutely free. Made with cooling technology, the best pillow ever just got even better. And this just in, nine brand new colors and styles of our Percale bed sheets. They're made with the finest long staple cotton, and now you can save 50% or more. That's as low as $24.98. And for the first time this year, I'm bringing you our My Slippers and Sandals for as low as $25 a pair. 
So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code to get your MyPillow 2.0s. Buy one, get one free. Percale sheets as low as $24.98. My slippers and sandals as low as $25 a pair. And for a limited time, when you order $75 or more, your entire order ships absolutely free. Mike Lindell here. And like you, I see our country being destroyed daily. We face massive economic issues. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, there are people in power who threaten the values that have made our country great. Well, I've been a believer in gold and silver for a long time, and I've searched for years for a partner that shares my values. Well, Genesis Gold Group showed me how easy it is to protect your IRA, 401k, or your retirement with gold and silver. Their faith-driven approach to service and stewardship is one that stands out from the rest. So call Genesis Gold Group now at 1-800-200-GOLD. That's 1-800-200-4653 or go to lindellgoldrush.com now. We are back on the Hope Report. We're talking to Dennis Cole of Narrowgate News and Dramatic Christian Ministries. And I was just thinking over the break, you know, I just posed the question to Dennis, talking to touch on a little bit of his testimony and what led him into ministry and theater. And I was thinking, Dennis, about how, uh, you know, what drew me to you is probably a lot of what drew me to Mike Lindell because he was like a square peg. He didn't fit in a corporate mold. He was just this eclectic guy that wasn't trying to be anybody else. And the people like that are so rare nowadays where, you know, you're just embracing who you are and you're kind of a theater kid. You're kind of this, you're this eclectic guy. So did you always have that you know, back when you were young, that drive to perform? I just got to say what. I'm not avoiding your question. I want to give my testimony with all, with all my heart. I just got to say, Mike Lindell is the most, he's kind of an ongoing testimony. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he, he's taken his testimony into an application about, about loving people enough to love America to tell us the truth. I so, so appreciate that. And I, and I, and I want to be like that. Um, I would say as a young child, I, uh, we, 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 we I was born in the Bronx, New York, but we grew up in uh, in, the, in the suburbs of of, of, of of Manhattan or New York, uh, Westchester County. And I remember going to baseball games. Uh, my whole family, uh, that is just extended family, we're Yankee fans, baseball, Mickey Mantle, all that stuff. And uh, as a very young child, I wanted with a passion three things. One was to be a professional baseball player for the Yankees. Uh, my second choice was to be a movie star because I was infatuated with, with glamour and fame and all that stuff. And I used to love, I mean, I am a natural actor. So I used to watch, you know, uh, movies very much you know, like any kid. And the third thing I wanted to be, which was kind of like, where did I come from? Is more than one I became sort of, uh, which is my third joy, uh, ambition was to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor. And, <laughs> which is funny because, <laughs> But now as I grew up and I, you know, switched, I went from uh, careerizing to calling, I'll, I'll leave that up to that in the testimony. But uh, I, I found that I became much more of the healer, much more of the empathic, more of the, even the theatrical stuff is totally about healing. It's about caring. It's about learning to, to, uh, learning to express love and truth. That's the best thing I can say about acting. I, I, but don't let me get ahead. I, I, I know you need my testimony. So here I am. We're growing up in Westchester County. Everybody I knew was Jewish, totally, totally Jewish neighborhood in a uh, in a cooperative thing. So everybody was Jewish. My father was in the garment business uh, in New York, which is very Jewish. And, and my mother was a beautiful Italian lady. Uh, and, and we had happy days, very happy days. 
uh, and uh, we'd go to the Catskill Mountains and I'd go to synagogue. I told my parents, I like synagogue. I like Jewish more than Catholic. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> they go, that is good. Yeah, that is good. Yeah, well, it's the truth, Mom. I, I really do like it. It's better. You know, you get to see some golly, 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 some golly, golly. I'm a darling, my hick of hoots. <laughs> it's fun. That's fun. And that was my yeah. experience with the synagogue. <laughs> Catholic Church was like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> it's serious. Anyway, the truth is we didn't go to that much either, Catholic Church. But what happened was something significant happened. And I bring it up because it's really part of my testimony. It's really significant. So some people would say, well, it's a big deal. People get divorced all the time. Big deal. For me, it was like <sighs> my mother was suicidal when my father left my mother. She was suicidal for years. My sister Marianne doesn't even know about it because it was all kind of private. But I was four years older than Marianne. My brother was four years older than me. So I was like there watching my mother like try to kill herself when my dad left her. And it was like so, so painful. I still feel it. She was so abandoned. She was so. She was so lost, if that's, that's the right word. And uh, she talked to me and I listened to her. So I, it sort of became uh, something that I wouldn't have been, been except that extraordinary uh, different happened. But uh, we went to a new town. My parents were gonna get back together, but it didn't work out. And he went on a business trip. On my 12th birthday, my dad did, and he never came back because mm. he didn't go on a business trip. They split up again. But <clears throat> it was very difficult because I'd have to lie. We moved from Valhalla, New York, to Rye, New York. If, uh, if you know anything about Rye, New York, it's probably the wealthiest town in the world, <laughs> quote, unquote. And maybe Greenwich, Connecticut it was two towns over as the other wealthy town. But very, very well-to-do. and Nice people, by the way, but I, I had to hide. I thought everybody's father was leave it to Beaver or father knows best. And here my parents were split up. I was totally went into shame mode and I lied and lied. My father's on a business trip. He's away. Uh, Why is your father never around? I lied. And I lied. And, I, and that's a big cover up, obviously. So you, you learn to cover up at a young age, like, whoa. And I, I, I live with that for a long, long time. I, uh, the most important for me, thing to me, even though I was a terrific athlete, in other words, I play a lot of sports. Uh, three sports and people saw me as a great athlete, but my real passion was that people would like me. I just wanted to be liked. Uh, mm -hmm. when I didn't get voted as best liked in my high school graduation, that to me was devastating. Why wasn't I best liked? I worked so hard mm -hmm. for it. Uh, I remember in college now up in Boston, I mean, I was like in the big city of Boston, if you will, and I wasn't famous in Rye, New York. I didn't have my varsity letters and I didn't have my ambition to be popular. I just became that introvert. I just went off in a corner and I became very depressed, very depressed uh, in, in college. And then uh, somehow I broke out of it by the end of my freshman year. And then I started to get normal. Things got kind of normal. I was starting to work from the inside out. Uh, I didn't want to be popular anymore. I was, good things were happening when I was in college uh, that were breaking me out. But the, the scar was there. So let me take a break from my testimony for a second. You want to ask me a question? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just listening to you and I, <laughs> I appreciate, no, I appreciate your openness and your, it's very touching hearing you share about that. And I'm struck by you and Mike Lindell and me. I mean, we all have that common thread of a father wound and then wanting to be liked and wanting to have acceptance and performing to get accept, you know, the works based way of trying yeah. to get acceptance. So it sounds like you were, you didn't have any relationship. I mean, you were, a, I guess, a cultural Jewish kid, it sounds like. I mean, but there, I, I'm, I can't wait to find out how you came to Jesus because he apparently chased you down. You can come well, back to that well, if you want to go over something my else. My years in Rye, New York, were like from age 12 to uh, after I graduated high school. And I still lived in Rye for a couple of years after college, okay? Let's just say that. 
So my years in Rye were, were there's no, that was not a Jewish town at all. In those days, it was what we, we used to call white Anglo-Saxon Protestant wasp, white mm-hmm. Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and nobody was Christian. It was just that we were wasps. And I, of course, mm-hmm. I had jet black hair, so I didn't fit in. He used to call me Guinea, which is very un- un- unflattering. <laughs> you know, they didn't know what to call me because I wasn't, you know, black. I wasn't truly white, like a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Wasn't rich. Mm-hmm. Oh, we weren't rich at all. And I was around a lot of wealthy people, but I was affable, and I became extremely well known. <laughs> and I worked hard at it. But, but uh, did you say you were as, affable? As good an affable? Is that what you said? Affable. Affable. I, I think affable I means the, outgoing. I love it? that word. I used it in my book. No, I, I don't hear people say it too much. No. So you, yeah, you, know, you were kind I, of a. Were you a people pleaser? Did you did you get uh, you know slightly? So I was a people pleaser. From people? Okay, go on. Yeah, I, I tell you. <laughs> If everybody I knew in high school was a drug addict, I would have started drugs in high school. Believe me. Mm. Whatever they were doing, I would do. It just so happens it was a well-to-do town with this fantastic history of sports. And mm. I was a football player, a wrestler. Wrestling was my best sport because it really <laughs> it really challenged me. I had to really go through it. Because you know, mm-hmm. if you get pinned in a wrestling match, you, you want to die. You know, <laughs> And, and if, but if you win, it's like oh my god, it's, it's, you're like you're in heaven for five for five minutes, you know. But baseball was my best sport. I, that was the one I loved the most. But uh, by the time I got around to baseball, I was so tired from playing those other two sports that the, my best sport was baseball. I, I hardly got a chance to even do it, though I did it very well. But I I couldn't even enjoy it so much. I was exhausted. <laughs> but um, when I was in college, they. Uh, I went out for baseball my freshman year because that's the one sport I was going to keep when I was in college. And I found out it was the spring of that year that they would not allow me to be on the team. Even though I just made the team, I was going to be the second baseman. But they came out with a report in my freshman year of high of college uh, at Northeastern University in Boston that I wasn't allowed to be on the baseball team because my grades were so bad in high school that they had to put me on probation for a year. Now, that mm-hmm. devastated me. I couldn't play baseball. After a year, it was horrible. I was coming out of my shell, and I couldn't play baseball. And then I was devastated. And that's when I started doing marijuana. First oh, time. I didn't even know that and about you. And I did you. marijuana. What's that? I didn't even know that about oh. you, that you got into uh, drug use at all. Well, you know, in those days, they would call it recreational. But it was a passion to me. And from age 19 to age 34, I did marijuana all the time. Uh, not every day, but certainly on weekends. And certainly, uh, you know, I just made it, it as part of my life. And the, re- the reason I bring it up, I had one mescaline trip too. One mescaline. You know, mescaline is, uh, ooh, ooh, watch out. <laughs> Man, what happened to me with the mescaline trip, I was about 20 some odd years, I was still, still in college. I went on a mescaline trip. My my experience went beyond my maturity. Therefore, I had experience with 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 things, with feelings, and love and care, but I didn't have the experience to back it. Mm. And I went through about 10, 12, 15 years of catching up because of that one mescaline trip. Wow. Uh, I know some people it's a big deal, but that's how I took it. My sensitivity did that to me. Well, I was going to say, Dennis, and, uh, you know, I can definitely relate to the sensitivity. My father used to always say, Melissa, you wear your heart on your sleeve, you know, and I was always right. overreacting to things. And you had this father wound. You had this brokenness. It sounds like sports right. helped you stay somewhat grounded, yeah. you know, having that positive outlet. But ultimately... How did you come to a place of seeking God to find identity in your relationship with Jesus? Well, let's just say I went through my 20s. Uh, I didn't explore acting like I should have, like I could have. Um, I think the the constant marijuana use uh, got me from... One thing about acting is it's about literal things. It's about tangible things. And and real life is about tangible things. But but drug use is about conceptual things. And I went into concept and I never could actualize what I really wanted to do. 
I, I took acting classes. I was living in New York at the time in, in Manhattan and in, in different different boroughs. But I, I, I did stay stay with acting uh, in my twenties, uh, studying it. But I never could really complete it. I got my ac actor's equity, but I didn't complete that either. I, I was in the garment business by accident, uh, uh, sort of a my own little. I call it Dennis Cole Ltd. I had my own little sales organization, and because I was creative, I went into design because I just would do that. Uh, but it was sales. I made a good living. I made a real good living, uh, but there was something incomplete because I really should have been an actor. I tried acting. I didn't like the whole the whole homosexual thing in the theater world. I didn't like it. Even as a non-believer, I didn't like it. I, you know, it just wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't, and, and it was very pretentious. I thought the acting was very pretentious. But I was always so natural about it. So I, I kind of developed my acting by being a businessman, starting my own little company, trying design, and it, the, a kind of methodology happened, which is sort of the way I am now. I found my own little way to find who I was. Mm. And I was living with my girlfriend, uh, who was my wife? <laughs> okay, Wendy was my Wendy. girlfriend. Wendy Cole, but she wasn't Wendy Cole. She was Wendy. Uh, Wendy Hazlett. Beautiful, loved her, absolutely loved her. And she she encouraged me uh, in different ways. Of course, she did whatever I would do, and I was doing whatever she was doing. We were both into the metaphysical. Uh, Carlos Castanadas, you know, boom, smoke your grass, dog, you know. <laughs> you know. But there was something more tangible going on with Wendy. I liked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we started a newspaper. We worked for a newspaper in Woodstock, New York. We, we became residents of Woodstock, New York. Uh, now, the Woodstock, New York that I was a resident of was the same people that created the festival in 1969. But this is now 1980, 81, 82, 83. And uh, the people that promoted the concert 10, 12, 15 years before are the people that lived in Woodstock. So it was the Woodstock, but not the concert. But we, uh, I was doing the softball league and I was playing baseball. I was living out my major league dream. Uh, they had cameras. They, they filmed us. <laughs> but I was the journalist. Wendy and I started a back page for the Woodstock Townsman. It's significant that this happened because I wrote an article called Sports Page, which I wrote about anything that came to my mind. I would write about the economy. I'd write about the world, the way people are. What if, I used to say, there was no good things being produced in our culture? What if we weren't producing anything good in the culture? What would that do to capitalism? What would that do to the economy? What if there was nothing to buy because everything was junk and bad? I used to ask these questions. This is before I became a Christian. And I wrote them down. And my mother, who had just become a Christian, she said to me, Oh, my mother, I forgot to say my mother. She met a nice guy, Frank. She got married and she got over my father, suicide, all kinds of great things. She became a Christian before anybody else. And uh, she used nice to say, God. Dennis, I love those articles you're writing for that Woodstock paper because I'd send them to her. I said, really? What do you like about it? She goes, you're growing, Dennis. There's something happening to you. She never pushed her Christian faith on me, but she let me know that she was a Christian and that's where I was going. <laughs> she let me know that, but I didn't. I wasn't relating. I just enjoyed writing. And Wendy, oh, Wendy was a great reporter. But here we are. We have the whole town watching us. Wendy's doing uh, front page news uh, reports. I'm doing back page stuff. And we're developing this passion for journalism in Woodstock. And Woodstock was the most far left town you'd ever want to know. Woodstock in the 1980s is the world today in 2024. Mm. We had practice with the world that we live in today. 40 years ago in the 80s. It, it was so far left. and uh, But the town loved us because we wrote about sports and articles. And then one of the people on our uh, on our group, we had, a, we had a tarot card reader, we had an astrologer uh, who wrote for us. <laughs> we were totally new age people. And uh, one of them was former Frank La Peruda from Brooklyn. That's how we talk. I'm just a farmer. I just, but I live in, I know what, and that's how we talk. So anyway, so, so, so Frank was one of our friends and he says, he says, uh, he says, uh, you want to go to church? What, what do you mean go to church, Frank? Farmer Frank? The, the one on the corner. You mean the one that says erected 1854? He says, yeah, that one. I said, I thought that was your museum. He says, erected 1854. 
I said, I said, is I honestly, that's what I thought. He said, no, no, no. The guy is a bastard. He's a very nice man. He's not very smart. He's not, you know, he's, not, he's, not, I mean, he's a nice man. <laughs> that was, that was, so, so this new age guy invited you first, to church. Or someone from the yeah. new age group. <laughs> Yeah, but he, he was the most conservative of the New Age. In other words, he wasn't the astrologer. He wasn't the palm reader. He was farmer okay. Frank Laparuda, who wrote about how amazing it is to be a farmer. At 80 years old, he discovered he's really a farmer because he, 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 he lives in Woodstock, New York, and he has a garden in his, in his, in his backyard. <laughs> but, so he invited anyway, you to church. He, yeah, and we go to church. When he, when, when he said, yeah, why not, Dennis? You know, when he was always more conservative than me anyway. And I said, okay. And we went to church, and this man, uh, uh, Nelson Owen, Pastor Nelson, uh, he looks at us and he smiles. And we would go to church every other week, and we always come in late. And every time he came in, he gave a big smile. And I was so motivated to get that smile. I mean, it was really welcoming. It was genuine. And I don't remember anything that he said. His wife played the organ. And it wasn't a trendy, cool place. There's only about five or six people there. Maybe when all of Nelson's kids came, there was 12 people. He had six kids. They all came to church that day. There was 12. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's Bill who, who, who lived with his girlfriend, but he wouldn't sit next to her. He was too much of a Christian to sit next to her in church because, you know, Winnie and I, of course, had her. <laughs> we held hands church. We were living together, but we weren't Christian. <laughs> what the heck? We're, and, but yeah, right. we so kept this going was a back. Turning point for you. And then I just said one more story. I was, yeah, very, 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 very huge. Um, I don't think the testimony ends there, but it was a huge turning point. I was in Brooklyn that day doing my my um, <laughs> my sales route. I, I had customers in Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. It was a perfect job for me because I got to do it myself. I got to visit people. I didn't really work for one person. I worked for about a hundred different people over over fourteen years. I worked for about five people at a time. I was what they call a manufacturer's rep in men's sportswear. So I went to my customers that day, and my last stop was in Brooklyn to a new tarot card reader. I was going to tarot card readers all the time. And she talked to me, and we, I set myself up with a new tarot card reader, shook her hand, and then drove straight up to Woodstock because I heard that there was an evangelist. I didn't know what an evangelist was. That was coming to town uh, at uh, our church. And we went, we wanted to go because pastor said, come, come. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll come early. And I think I, I think it was a Thursday or a Wednesday. I think it was a Thursday. And I got home and sure enough, the evangelist was visiting our house with Nelson Owen, our pastor, Herb Hartman and Sheila. And Wendy's like a little sheepish, a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the, the pastor and the evangelist come to the house and we're living together, you know, <laughs> nice house, by the way, yeah. great view of Mount Tobias, 37 <laughs> acres of land. I loved it. <laughs> And, you know, one thing came to the next, and we went to church that night, and uh, I told the pastor, uh, Reverend Hartman, who was the evangelist, I said, you know, sorry nobody showed up to your altar call. I, I thought you preached a great sermon. Now, to this day, I don't remember what he said. I don't remember anything. But he saw something in my eyes. He says, would you like to come forward now? I said, what? Would you like to come mm -hmm. forward now? <laughs> so, and before I knew it, this is a Wesleyan church too. Uh, and our, Nelson Owen was hopping up and down and getting excited and, and just making friendly sounds. They weren't weird. They're just friendly and things were happening. And, and, and I went to bed that night with Wendy and I had this dream that night and I saw, and it, it, it was what I call an out of body dream, out of the body dream. It's where, uh, uh, it's a revelation dream is another one I call it. It's, it's from God. That's what I mean, too. And I'm out of my body, and I'm seeing that poor uh, uh, tarot card reader that I just met a few hours before, you know, earlier that day, if you will. And I watched her dissolve. Oh, good. The music's coming on perfect time. Dissolve right before my eyes. And I saw it was like a sloth demon on me. I don't blame the woman who's oh. a demon, though, and went off Wow, that is incredible. That is so powerful, Dennis. <laughs> I'm so glad you got to that. That's amazing. No, we're going to take a short break. We still have 10 minutes okay. left with Dennis. So stay with us. We'll be Ten right minutes. back okay. on the Hope Report. 
Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back. The my pillow guy. And you're looking good. I'm still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever. My pillow 2.0. <gasps> When I invented my pillow, it had everything you'd ever want in a pillow. Well, now there's new technology that makes it even better. My Pillow 2.0 has my patented fill combined with a cooling fabric with temperature regulating thread. My Pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of my pillow. Now's the time to go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use the promo code to save 50% on your MyPillow 2.0. Not only that, for a limited time, your entire order ships absolutely free. You're sleeping even better. And cooler, too. And you're looking good. Feeling, Feeling good. good. I knew you would. MyPillow.com. Meet Jim and Mary a seasoned couple who have weathered the storms of life and have witnessed the evolution of our great nation. Today, they embark on a journey that's as important as any they faced before, exercising their right to vote. They belong to a generation that built this country, fought for its values of faith, family, and freedom, and now they worry if their votes will truly count. But fear not, Jim and Mary are members of AMAC. As AMAC members, they can rest easier knowing that AMAC is at the forefront, fighting to reduce potential election fraud. AMAC stands tall, advocating for voter ID, opposing ballot harvesting, and scrutinizing the risks of mail-in ballots. Stand with Jim and Mary, join AMAC today, and let's preserve and uphold the values that make America strong. Because your voice matters, and so does your vote. We're back on the Hope Report with Dennis Cole. And I want to tell you before we get back to Dennis, make sure you use promo code HOPE to get in on Mike's $25 extravaganza going on right now at mypillow.com. So just use my pillow promo code HOPE and get some amazing deals on mypillow.com. Okay, back to Dennis. I'm really enjoying this time with you, Dennis. You're such you're such a dynamic guy. And you know, I don't care that you don't fit into the mold. That's one of the things I love about you. So we've got about eight minutes left. And when you're very good at wrapping up when you hear the music. So thank you for yeah. that. But you were you were just yeah. sharing how you came to this a dramatic conversion yeah. and this demon melting away before your eyes. And if you want to finish up with that, you can. And I also want to ask you about your ministry and how yeah. you, know, you bring the Bible segue. to life through acting. So yeah. let's get back yeah. to where we were before the break. I'll segue. It, it, it relates because also in Woodstock, we it took us three years after that salvation experience, and in fact, Wendy went forward too. She uh, she had had a childhood experience, but she really had a reconnection that same weekend. It was that same weekend. So she and I have this in common. It's a, a lot of things, but that's one of them. But what happened in those three years is I really got back to acting big time. But this time it was with the Holy Spirit. It was completely different. My fear about learning, blowing a line or something like that, it became like, so what? I'll make up a line. <laughs> As I said, I make up a line. Don't worry about losing your line. Just, just keep going. So I became an improvisational actor. It, it, it took it to another level. But one of the two or three significant things happened. One was a vision I had, and I don't get a lot of visions that are physical, but this one was real. It was a light over a rock. It was a tremendous piece. 
and I looked up at the moon and there was a there was a, a Jesus and Shakespeare. That's all I can tell you. It's a combination of Shakespeare, the theater, you know, 37 plays, and 120 sonnets, you know, the famous guy, the producer, director, actor, his actor name was Will Kemp, uh, Shakespeare's actor name. And I saw this and I saw clearly where God was leading me uh, and us, that I was going to have a theatrical enterprise that needed to be dramatic Christian ministries or narrow gate theater or narrow gate news. It had to be something that he was giving me that others could join. I wasn't going to be good at joining other people's stuff, who I love people, but I'd be better at starting something that others could be, other people can join. Uh, uh, I love Somebody that. Said, I love how you said the Holy Spirit. Let, sorry to interrupt your thought. You were going to give me something no. I found there. No, the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, you stopped trying to make stuff happen and, and uh, grind it out, and you just yielded to the Holy Spirit. I love that you just Just said like that. that. And that same night, I stopped doing marijuana. I know some people take them a while. I know some things take me a long time to change. Uh, some things did take me a long time to change. It was hard for me to, to uh, embrace... Uh, uh, evangelicalism, certainly conservatism, I had trouble embracing it. I was so lefty. It's hard for me to not, you know, mm -hmm. that took me a few years to do. But believe me, I changed. But uh, the, the <laughs> marijuana thing, though, completely changed. I didn't even want it. I didn't, I didn't know. And um, so we sold our 37 acres of land, our two houses, and we went into ministry thinking that's what everybody does, right? That's what you do. You sell everything. I mean, I didn't know any better. In Woodstock, nobody's telling me different because in Woodstock, there was nobody else was a Christian. <laughs> Really? Except for the yeah. people we came in contact with. All of our old friends didn't want to talk to us anymore. We were shunned. But we went to seminary. Uh, then I had to learn a whole other thing. I had to learn that other people uh, didn't come into faith like I did. And it's always been like breathing to me. Uh, yeah, we've had good days, bad days. We pastored. When we did pastor, we pastored for a number of years, which was a big surprise to me. Because I thought for sure I was going to immediately do plays and do Christian movies and all that stuff. But that's not what happened. God was taking me through more suffering. It was hard for me to do this, but I, but God was so close to me. I enjoyed the past three years, but I didn't build anything great. Half our congregation were drug addicts and homeless people, and the other half were middle class people like us who who knew who knew better. But I learned again. Jesus learned from the things he suffered, but I learned from watching people who suffered. It's not like the homeless people are the people that suffer. In fact, it's just the, the opposite. But seeing people that were so homeless and so drug addicted that when I got around, when we started DCM, Dramatic Christian Ministries, in January of 2001, and I used to do 120, 130 dates a year, I would go out and I can, I can minister to the middle class because I ministered to something that they weren't normally being ministered to, their loneliness, their fear, their, the where they do suffer. Raise your hand if you lose a child. You're a millionaire. You're a billionaire and you lose a child to a car accident that you're not suffering. Suffering is real, and I understood it, going back to my mother. By the way, my father, before he died, before I became a Christian, he was almost out of his mind. I don't mean this in a critical way. I mean this, he came to the end of himself. And he he couldn't function anymore. He just said, I want to have ham and eggs and my wife. I want my your mother back. I want her back. And I just absolutely got it. Mm. And I became his friend. He and I became close. He, he, I was the son he ignored. My, my brother's name was wow. Michael. Same name as my father. I was Dennis. Like, what, what? Dennis. I went to my father's funeral. They didn't know he had another son. But that, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that we bonded. It was an amazing thing. I got my father. And that helped me to find my father in heaven. The, I found the perfect script, the Bible. Started doing the Bible as the script. Um, we did a... Like I said, 120, 130 dates a year for a number of years. We've done about 2,000. We started an hour day theater in 2010. We we worked with with uh, uh, different people who wrote. Uh, Sandy Boykin wrote a play. We used her. All the other plays we've done, uh, quite frankly, are the ones I've written. Um, Cindy Spencer wrote a play. We did a play with her that she wrote too. But for the most part, I wrote uh, an adaptation of Scrooge. Uh, one of the greatest plays that I've ever, honestly, do you think I'm bragging? I'm not. It's a play called no. Switch. Uh, it's an amazing play, and I want to get it done uh, live again, but I want it done on film. Uh, uh, I, I definitely want to get it done on Switch. Uh, Journey Through the Narrow Gate, the other book I wrote, should be on film. It's, it's, it's an amazing story about recovery, breaking through, 
and it's something that a drug addict and a middle class person can relate to because I've been I've been in both camps. I understand. I understand. Suffering is suffering. When Mike Lindell goes out and he talks about America and he stands up for us, he's coming from a place of suffering, but he's talking to rich people too. We got to know that there's something missing. And so the narrow gay news is something we started when uh, when the church is closed. So let's put it that way. The church is closed in March 2020. Narrow gay news began. Now narrow gay news is so important to me, to us. It's improvisational news telling. It's, it's commentary on film clip. It's interviewing people like we're going to have you on very soon, Melissa, interviewing you awesome. and bringing you into your story into the story that's happening. The news that God, that God, God's media is these very personal stories that amplify. And they become, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the world. Mm. They come from the small to the all. I see it all. Yeah. And that's how God's media work. So narrow news is very important, but it's more, to me, it's more theatrical. It's more acting, but it's the kind of actor that, uh, that I had to be. Uh, I, 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 I I, I'm really sorry I had those 15 years of grass and the one night of mescaline. I am. And, and I, I'm sorry about it. I grieve over it. But the truth is, all things do work together for good. So God can turn the bad into good. And the fact that I had to fight so hard to start a theatrical career while I was a salesperson uh, and a designer in the New York, New York garment business, I had to find my own acting thing because it was in me. I had to find it. Well, it really worked. Me, it works for me well now because I'm good at starting things that other people can join. That's better. That's a better call for me. And that's what I, I love do. that. Uh, Praise God. What I do now, that he let, he what's led that you that way? No, I love how he led you into yeah, something the, that you are so uniquely suited for. And I have a unique insight into Jesus because of, remember, it starts with God reaches you and there's a part of you that's him. <laughs> the 7.5 yes. billion people in the world, there's a part of you that's him. And through the you that's him, you come up with something that nobody else would have done, but it, but it, but it's good for everybody. And I've Dennis, discovered something you're in the, in the, in the You're saying throat. many profound things today. You said God reaches I, I, the part the part of you that's Him. Is that what you just said? Exactly. That's exactly I right. I love it. He made you. Maybe 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 He made you. He created you. You're made in His image, and you're restored for those of us who come. But there's one more insight I have about Jesus. And remember, if he gets an insight about me, I get an insight about him. And I mm. see it on the road to Emmaus, and it's very much where I'm at right now. The main thing I do when I do a, a Bible acting now is two, two things that I'm doing in Bible acting. One is the Cleopas story, a, a play I wrote. Uh, it's also I do the Emmaus Road with a cast. I have a person play Cleopas and a person play his, uh, his partner, which is his wife, Miriam, in my, in my writing. And I play uh, the man that nobody understands. But um, but uh, I know you wanted me to talk about my book and stuff, but then let me finish this thought. But you the Cleopas minute, story minute. is, it is <laughs> where sorry. Jesus shows up and he doesn't look like Jim Caviezel. He doesn't look like Jim Caviezel. The book, The Man, is about Jesus showing up, not looking like Caviezel, not only on the Emmaus Road, but in 2024. The book is so much a testimony it's the Michael Lindell continuation to the testimony of Dennis Cole. It's so much Jesus' testimony. He's coming, he's saying, I can't, you put me in a box. I look more like you than you think I do. I look like wow. the person that, that you that suffered with. I've come to redeem that situation. That's the man, what hope is all we have. Advantage Books at ADVBookstore.com. Dramatic <laughs> I <got> it. Christian, <laughs> yes. DCMinistries.com is my site. Thank you, Dennis. We'll have you back again. Thanks, everyone. Have a blessed day. Oh, honor. God bless you. Thank you. God bless.